Okay, finishing up our discussion of free churro. I had you read the article by Catherine Norlock on our relationships with the imaginary dead, which I think is surprisingly poignantly relevant to this episode. We've talked before about this idea that you can have a relationship with somebody imaginary for certain purposes. This episode is about him struggling to find a way to have a relationship with the imaginary version of his mom who's in the casket and all of the interesting ways in which that both works and fails. He keeps talking to her and using her silences as part of the conversation. That's a powerful way of having a relationship with her in her imaginary version. But on the other hand, his various attempts to have an imaginary relationship with her fail as he realizes that they don't come together. But the power of our relationship with imaginary beings is a theme that keeps reemerging. And at one point he says, I never thought orphans were sad. I thought they were lucky because they could imagine their parents to be anything they wanted. This is a really telling quote, especially when we remember that his glory days were on a show about orphans. And people would tell him that the orphans were sad and he didn't think they were. Um, This idea that there is joy to be found in a relationship with an imaginary version of your parent is super interesting. What does this one-way imaginal relationship work like? Again, I think this is really what this entire episode is exploring. You can read the whole episode as about one-way imaginal relationships, right? Even back to the monologue at the beginning, his dad feels like he's talking to his son, but he's really not. He's having a one-way relationship with his son where he's basically just projecting an imaginary version that suits his conversational needs. But we see other richer, better versions of an imaginary relationship throughout this episode. And in a way, you know, if you're imposing an imaginary version of somebody on them instead of listening to them and talking to them for real and recognizing them for real, then you're doing them a disservice. You're failing to recognize them the way you should. But once somebody's dead, an imaginary relationship with them is the only kind available to us. And part of the suggestion here is that might be useful and illuminating in some ways, right? What Bojack figures out through, as it were, talking to his mother during this episode, which he's not really doing, turns out to be pretty powerful. So there is a role for this kind of imaginary relationship. I want to turn to what I think is an important ethical issue that this episode raises, which has a lot of um, real world um, resonance for me. When somebody dies, (coughs) particularly somebody who you're supposed to be close to, like your mother or your husband or your child, say. There's a huge social expectation that you are supposed to be grief-stricken in a very specific way and that that relationship, no matter what problems it might have had, ultimately is to be thought of as a good thing and a loving thing that you've lost. There's a deep social assumption that ultimately, no matter what the problems might have been, Everyone loves their mother. Everyone loves their husband. Everyone loves their wife. Everyone loves their child. And so when there's a death of that sort, we just assume that the person has to be grieving a lost loved one. So what happens when that person, who there's enormous social pressure to take as a loved one, was in fact abusive, and you weren't in fact connected to them, and you don't love them, right? How do you grieve that person? You have no social room to grieve that person or no social scripts that tell us how to grieve that person. All of our social scripts for these deaths, let's just focus on the death of your mother because it's the case we're talking about here. Anything you look at that talks about the death of a mother is about the loss of somebody who you might have had a troubled relationship to, but who ultimately, deep down, you deeply loved and they loved you and of course that is going to be experienced by you as an enormous loss and if somebody doesn't experience the loss of their mother as an enormous loss 
if they don't experience that as a loss of love, if their mother ultimately was so abusive that they couldn't connect to her, that makes us really socially uncomfortable, right? We want to say, oh yeah, I understand that she was terrible, but you know, you know how it is. Ultimately, it's your mother and you got to love them. And think what that does to somebody who really doesn't love their mother for good reasons, right? That doesn't give them any room to understand or express their grief in another way because their grief becomes socially unacceptable. And so Bojack, like anyone who had a totally abusive mother who really they didn't love, Bojack is in a super uncomfortable position here, right? He is grieving for real. He says, my mother is gone and everything is worse. He is feeling a real loss. But what he's feeling the loss of is the imaginary relationship that he was hoping would someday become possible. He's not feeling the loss of the actual person. And we don't have good social room for that. We don't tell people how to grieve in that way. What we do instead is we impose on people a narrative where ultimately deep down the relationship was a good one and it was filled with love, blah, blah, blah. And that can be really hurtful and confusing and unhelpful for somebody who's trying to find and needs to find a different way to grieve. And I gave you a reading about that too. And one of the things I hope it makes you reflect on is, you know, next time somebody loses a parent or a sibling or a spouse or whatever it may be, whether you or somebody else, don't make assumptions about what kind of relationship that was. Just because we have a lot of TV shows and social narratives where everyone loves their mother and those relationships are always ultimately good, even if they're annoying, doesn't mean that that's everyone's reality. And we do the opposite of holding someone in personhood if we steamroll over that experience and tell them that they have to experience this death as a conventional loss of a loved one, right? That does not give them room to make sense of and hold on to their own feelings and figure out how to complete their story of grief in a way that makes sense for them, which is very hard to do when you really, for good reasons, hated the person. How do we get past this fantasy about what social relations and family relations are supposed to look like when other people impose it on us? And so we've talked a lot about the role of fantasy in making relationships, but when other people's fantasies get in the way, right? When other people tell you what your relationship with your mother must have ultimately deep down been like, then that does damage and it's imposed on you against your will and it's a sort of a curtailment of your autonomy and your ability to make sense of your own narrative. The very end of the episode, he ends with his dad's message to him from the car, right? that he guesses it's good that no one will look out for him. It's a very sad message. I think that the use of looking is key here, right? This whole time I've been talking about recognition. When he says, I guess it's good that I've learned that no one will look out for me. I think that when, what he's really flagging is this idea that no one is going to really see him, right? The emphasis should, there should be on the word look. No one is going to really see him and recognize him for who he is. He's constantly begging for this and he never gets it, right? And Diane tells him over and over again that the whole idea that anyone is going to really see you as you really are is based on this kind of myth that there's a true you down there to be seen. So it might not even make sense as a fantasy, but it's a fantasy that he and other people desperately want, right? We want to be seen. And not only is he not gonna be seen, but as we saw, he's busy not seeing back either. So it's not like he's just the victim here. He's doing as much failing to recognize others as he is failing to be recognized. So ultimately, we all want to be seen, and there's a real question about whether any of us really are in the way that we need to be. Okay, I'm going to end that.